And uh, it's important that you know this. So if somebody says go to the bow of the boat, the stern of the boat, that you know what part they're referring to. And um, there are lots and lots, unbelievable number of websites, not just Coast Guard or Coast Guard Auxiliary or Power Squadron or what have you, all the other boating uh, affiliations out there. And they're animated so that you can actually watch boats going through the water or an animation to it. So we invite you to follow up with that. Go cruise on the website and pick a topic that's of interest to you, whether it's not boat handling, um, weather, it's there for you right at your fingertips. So we invite you to do that. There's a lot of organizations that also give boating safety courses that give you completion certificates at the end. The Coast Guard Auxiliary is one of them, the Power Squadron is another, and there's a slow, whole slew of them. Some of them are all online, some of them is a combination of online and in person, some are just in person, so whatever your learning style is, there's one for you out there. And if you walk away with nothing else today, know that we are not even on the tip of the iceberg of what information is out there about boating safety. This is like um, uh, an infomercial, okay? <laughs> Think of it as a, an hour and a half infomercial. <laughs> and uh, you have a folder, and in the folder are a number of handouts. You can look at them at your own leisure. The two of them we'll be referring to today is we have one on knots. We're going to be practicing that. And we're going to be practicing tying cleats as well. So you'll have visuals for these. Uh, and the other ones, as we go through here, and, and it's a conversation piece, we'll jump into it. Otherwise, it's um, visual candy for you to look at. So we have the nomenclature. Gunnel, cleat, stern, transom. Beam, freeboard, draft, hull, propeller. I understand that uh, the boats that you'll be on are between uh, 20 and 24 feet, and they're all outboards. Would you believe in this PowerPoint presentation there, I think we have one picture of an outboard. <laughs> but that's okay because they're just general um, uh, concepts that can be applied to a vessel of any size. Probably one of the most important things up here is the draft, and that is how much water you're going to draw. So one of the things to be careful about is don't think, oh, I have plenty of water underneath me when actually you've got a lot of boat underneath you as well. So you should be able to pay attention to the depth of the water as well as the, the draft of your boat. What can, what's the minimum amount of water your boat can go in? And one thing this slide shows is usually the deepest part of the boat <laughs> is the prop. Now, one of the things about this slide, um, you know, forward, someone will say go forward. That means just go, look, go to the bow of the boat. Uh, starboard, port, and aft. The way, the reason starboard and port are important is because there's lights that go along with that. On the starboard side of the boat, you have a green light. On the port side, you have a red light. It's very important when we get into how you navigate out of the water. The way I always remembered it was port is four letters, left is four letters, port line, red. So if you remember that, the default, starboard is green. Okay, so important to know port and starboard and the color lights, and we'll, you'll see that as we go along. When Sally gets out rattled, instead of saying left or right, I say port is starboard. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, let's say that in your boat there's a there's a seat that looks aft. So now you're looking this way. The bow is still behind you, but you're looking here. So you think that this over here is the starboard side, and this is the port. And it's kind of the the, who's ever at the helm, if you say something's to the port, it is really the starboard. So port and starboard is relative to the bow. 
and we could say the pointy end of the bow, but I don't have a pointy end on the, on our bow that's it's a rounded one. So always know where you are in relation to the front of the bow of the bow, so you know what you, what's your star bit and what's your port. And um, guess what 3A Marine has lots of? Tie calendars. And don't stick it at the, in the bottom of your of your book bag, because as we were talking about, we need water under the boat, and we have tides. And did you know when there's a full moon or a new moon, we can have minus tides and plus tides? So also the chart might say that there's five feet of water right here, and we have a lunar tide for which there may be one foot there. Where you find that out of that tide chart, chart uh, tell you not only the time of the high and the low, but what what the depth is as well. So these should be close to the helm or close in, in a pocket or be able to whip it up and look at it. The other thing about boats is depending upon the size of the boat, depends upon how much gear the size of the engine, and the number of people you can have on the boat. It's called a capacity plate. If you don't know who your capacity plate is on your boat, put that on your list. Find where that is. And it will say the number of persons for a number of pounds. And this used to be based on 150 pounds. They've upped it to 180 because Americans have gained some weight here. So when Jay and I bought our boat 21 years ago, the capacity on the boat for people was 10. It's now eight. So we recently had a new capacity plate made up to represent that we know that the law has changed and we now have eight. Uh, we don't take eight on the boat. It's just, it's although the capacity is there. <coughs> the other thing, it also includes the, um, the gear and the motor. Now, for our boat, the minimum size engine on it was a 75 horsepower. The max was 115. We had the max 115, which is going to reduce the number of people we can have on the boat because we have the bigger, heavier engine sitting on the transom. Uh, so that's important. Take a look at that on your boat. The other thing we have is a floor plan. And two of them are in your folders. One is a simple one by Boat Ed Tom. And another one is by the Coast Guard Coast Guard Auxiliary. So they look like this. And if you go online, you will find extraordinarily many, many versions of this. Here's the one that makes most sense to you. And what a flow plan is, you have something called pre-planning, where if you know you wanted to go out today, and you got up, and you said, oh, this rain's going to taper off, or the wind's supposed to come down in the late afternoon, that's not enough information for you, because you probably got that from uh, the regular land, mainland, weather. You need to go to the NOAA for the marine weather. And then what you do is at home, on your kitchen table or office desk, you fill out this form. What is your itinerary? Where are you going to go? When do you think you're going to be leaving? When do you think you're going to be back? And then another thing, very important, a contact person. So if you don't show up where you said you're going to be, and you need to call the Coast Guard, that individual has all the information, the person to call, the number, what have you. And some are more elaborate than others, and as you'll see, one's a three-pager, one's a one-pager, and there's other configurations thereof. Even if you take a piece of line paper and write that information down and give it to whomever it is, a family member, your next-door neighbor, someone that's articulate, and can be able to explain this. So if you said that you were going to be calling at a certain time and that person didn't get it, two, three, four hours go by, 
this is, becomes very important. Because I can't, and one of the things I would encourage, like you, you may not fill one out every single time you get underway, <clears throat> sorry, every time you get underway, but I would say fill one out that has all the pertinent vote information. And then if anything, put a little sticky on it with the date and where you're going that day and leave it with someone. I can't tell you how many calls we got at the station. Somebody didn't come home. They we expected them at 6 p.m. They're not here. It's 8 p.m. at night. The sun is setting. We get out to the launching ramp. The boat and the trailer are still there. We ask, okay, how big is the boat? They don't know. What color is the boat? We don't know. What kind of a boat? We don't know. So now all we know is we're looking for a boat. So fill out a flood plan maybe at the beginning of the season with all the pertinent information of your boat. Leave it with somebody that would be the person that's going to call and say, hey, my loved one had to come home and I don't know what's going on. And oftentimes the boat's disabled, the radio's down, they're out of cell communication, and they're just waiting for someone to please come and find them. So it's a lot easier for the Coast Guard, the Harbor Masters, and any Marine Patrol, if they have the pertinent information, they know they're looking for a 26 foot white, you know, boat with so many people on board, MS numbers, um, what kind of an engine, just makes it so much easier. Because as you're out cruising around, you can kind of start to look. So most people, I will tell you, do not fill that out every single time. And that's fine, but fill it out once. And then like Sally said, just maybe, you know, kind of update it with a piece of paper on where you think if you're, if you're a fisherman, where you might go fishing that day. It gives everybody a starting point. All right. And if by any chance you change your plan, <laughs> because it's going to be sunny and weather in Boston Harbor and heading down, you know, out to Boston Light or something, you need to call that person that's got your boat plan that you put the little sticky on and update that so that they're not looking for you in another place. <laughs> and we talked about pre-planning, making sure that it's the marine weather as opposed to the mainland weather. Actually, both of them are good to know because you can then play against the both of them. Uh, and then we do a pre-departure check. So we make sure that we have the safety equipment that we need, and we're going to be going over that with you. And you take your time with this. And because of the COVID, for anyone um, that's at a marina or a yacht club with, with docks or at a launching ramp, you can't really dally on the dock. They want you to get down there in your boat and go. And that's all anti what we're talking about here today because we want to do the pre and away check to make sure that our anchor line isn't all tangled up in the anchor locker. That you want to check to make sure that your fire extinguisher is in the green and not the red. Just a little quick check that might take you seven to ten minutes, depending on the size of your boat. Uh, and so this is what they do when you do a little check on their head in their head as things are going onto the boat. The Coast Guard Auxiliary does something called special safety checks. Another organization that does that is the Power Squadron. And there are some requirements that are federal and some that are state. And these are free, non-law enforcement, very user-friendly that goes through to see if you have all the equipment and if it's um, in operable good condition. And um, next slide. And if you have all those goodies, you get a decal. And there's a different, every year, there's, it changes the date on it. So an auxiliary or a power squadron, that little standard can look at the boat to see if they need an updated one. Why do you want to do this? Any law enforcement entity can do, can pull you over to see if you have the equipment that you need. This could, problem yes. <laughs> <laughs> this could save you some money, folks, and some um, aggravation because it could ruin your day. If, for instance, you have life jackets, they're brand new, they're in a plastic bag, 
You want to keep them clean, right? Or you have them in a bag and it's zippered and it's then tucked underneath a bunk somewhere. And a white jacket has to be, if you're not wearing it, which on small boats we recommend that you do, they have to be easily grabbed and put on. And there's a purple sheet in your folder that we'll talk about this. There's some new language for it. And this is the pared down one. This is actually like eight pages and we got it down to three. At your leisure, some more visual candy for you to check that out. Lisa, do you have more to add to that? Um, well, one of the things I'll tell you is uh, when I was running boats, when I was a boarding officer, and when you go out, if you see that, it does, it may not prevent us from boarding you. What it does do is if we start off with, you know, a more positive attitude that, oh, this is probably going to have everything. And I mean, I have to confess, we probably don't do as, you know, detailed because we figure somebody's already done that. But we're going to look at important things. We're going to look at life jackets. And my absolute, any Coast Guard boarding officer's pet peeve is life jackets that are hidden in a cabin somewhere. And so I'm saying, all tucked away. The purpose of them is to be readily lost as readily accessible. So when you get underway and you have guests on board, first of all, for yourselves, you should get a PFD, get it fitted to you, put your name on it. That's your PFD. When you get underway, that comes out. It's on a deck somewhere. It's, you know, you, you can be out of, out of your way, but it needs to be, you need to be able to grab it. And then if you have guests on board, a lot of PFDs for them, get them fitted. You don't want to have to put on a PFD and start figuring out how to tighten it up if the boat is sinking on water. Or God forbid you have a fire on the boat. Nothing more horrifying on a boat than fire. So, so important. And what will happen in the vessel safety check is they're going to look at your PFDs. They're going to test them. See how long it's taking her to five thousand dollars? Your boat is sinking. You got to get in the water, and you're fiddling with the strap. And she's still fiddling with the strap, but the boat is sinking. So now she's in the water, and the thing's floating over her head. So it, I'm not acting here, folks. <laughs> so that's why at the beginning of the season. Like I have a PFD on my boat. It's got my name on it. That's the one I pull out. It's mine. I put it off to the side. So when you get the vessel safety check, they're going to check them to make sure the straps are still good. And then they're going to just, you know, look overall, make sure there's no tears or anything like that. But what they're mostly going to look for is that they're readily accessible. Do not tuck them away in your nice little life, your nice little white bag that says life jackets. All right. So, but the vessel safety checks are really important. It won't stop a boarding officer from coming on board. But it does, they do it with a more positive attitude. We'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this was a brand new one. So this is the kind of thing you're going to run into if you're, if they are tucked away neatly um, and that you're trying to fiddle it and, um, and get it hooked up. So this is just an example. I'm not asking here. We've got some questions. So how would you get somebody to come to do that? Okay, the question is, how do we get, how do you arrange to get the safety check? Um, because of the COVID, it's a, a lot, um, it takes a lot more time. For a vessel examiner, you can go online, especially for the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and there is a form that you can fill out, you put in your zip code, and an examiner will call you and make an appointment to come down to your boat, whether it's at the launching ramp in your club or wherever the boat is, they'll come and do that. If it's a travelable boat, you have it in the yard, and you have everything that is supposed to be on it within the, when it's in the water, it even can be arranged to do it in your yard. And the other thing is that typically what happens when there's no COVID, the auxiliary and the power squadron schedule them at the art clubs and arenas, and so that in any Saturday or Sunday morning, there's usually a team, two or three or five, um, 
uh, really want it. Again, that arena is a New York club sponsor it, but sure to have arena sponsors it. Hewitt sponsors it. And there's a, a poster somewhere with a phone number to call. But because of that this year, uh, you need to um, you need to initiate that rather than having uh, the auxiliary or the power squadron to do that. Okay, so we have, did, did a, more of these come or is this our stash here? Yeah, that's the stash. Okay, uh, we will have time um, to practice. If you want to play with this, then put it on. And we have a sanitizer hanging around here so that you can wash your, wipe your hands uh, before you touch it. <laughs> The next one is boating accessories. There are some things that are nice to have on the boat, and there's other things that you have to have. They're a requirement. And you need to have an anchor, and you need to have anchor lines. And what's recommended is that you have spare parts and tools, a compass and chart, a radio. We want to get back to the radio because that's a discussion all to itself. Line, first aid kit, water is important, drinking water, uh, as opposed to just sodas and um, Gatorade and things like that. I think most of these are supposed to be required, believe it or not. The anchor and the anchor line are. That's safe, isn't it? Hmm? I think that's safe. I don't well, whether it's state or, state or federal, you need it on the boat. <laughs> and, um, and an anchor to go with the anchor line. And we'll have uh, some other slides that will demonstrate that as we go into this. But let's go back to talk about the radio because we're going to hit that now. And we get hit it again near the end. Cells are wonderful on the mainland. And they're iffy on the water. You get away from any cells, you're going to lose it. So as much as our cells have, you know, emergency little buttons you can push and what have you, but if we can't get it across the airways, it's not going to get where it's going to go. It is highly recommended that you have a VHF FM radio on your boat. And you can get handhelds that are sort of nifty. They can fit in your pocket. They can fit on the dashboard. The thing is, is that the effectiveness of a VHF FM radio is the height of the antenna. So if you are a cabin cruiser and you have a flying bridge and then you have a, uh, a 10 foot antenna, you can reach many miles. You probably could go out 30 miles with that. A handheld in my hand talking, I'm going to be lucky if I can get a, a mile out of it especially at Turn Harbor, where we've got what we call Cement City. We've got the condos there. Um, uh, Station Point Island, they can't hear us. And we're just, uh, you know, five miles by the way that the seagull flies. So we highly recommend that you get one that is installed in your boat and runs off the boat battery. If you can't have that, the next step thing is a handheld. Uh, but it's, um, we recommend having it the one that's actually installed. And with that, we'll hit it again later on. And uh, this is new as of April 2021. I'm going to let Lisa talk about this one. All right. It says now on, on boats that are less than 26 feet. So if you're exactly 26 feet, then you don't have to worry about this. But if you're less than 26 feet, it's a lanyard that goes into the, into the ignition and then it's attached to the person operating the boat. The idea being that if something should happen, you get thrown off to the side or whatever. It's a, as you move, it's gonna, it's gonna pull out, it's gonna kill the engine. Jet skiers have them all the time. So it's nothing new for someone on a jet ski. This is new for boaters. So keep in mind, if you don't have it, you're gonna have to somehow get that, that installed. In any new boat, it will come with the lanyard. It isn't anything you have to buy. It will come with it. And um, the thing is, it doesn't work unless you attach it. 
<laughs> okay, you got to attach it to your person. Well, I think so, and that you, you can spend more money and you can get a remote that you're not physically tied, it's electronically tied, <laughs> so it will do the same thing, but it's not wrapped around you. I was just going to ask, do you not pull over for a safety check and the lane is not attached to your person? Is that something you get back a Yeah, it's a violation. Yeah. Probably not a hefty fine associated with it, but because it's new this year, so you, a nice person, might give you a warning and say, hey, you know, we know it's a new requirement, be sure, and, and they'll make sure you put it on right then and there. If you don't have it on the boat, that's going to be a whole different story. If you have it, and then, you know, Sally said, new boats come with them now, but if you have it on the boat and it's not on your person, you might get a warning. If it's not on the boat, you're probably going to get a violation. Is it just, is, it's just the driver, and is it just, just when you're actually that. driving, just or is it when you're on the boat? So if you switch off, you have to switch off the lid. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you walk away <laughs> with the wind, you, or you reach over for something, <laughs> you're going to cut your engine off. So for me, I have to, I move around a lot. And um, I'm a little bit of a wiggle worm. I have to be really careful that I don't chuck the engine off. <laughs> yeah, is that something that three day marine have? It looks pretty simple, but it attaches to the key and then has a clip that attaches. It doesn't look like you need like somebody to install it, like you use. I'm sure they do. I mean, I'm not positive. Um, but if you called and talked to someone in park, they would know right away. It looks, but it looks pretty simple though, right? It is. It's, it's just like a terminal shutoff. It's, it's, it's very yeah. simple. It's not, and it's not an expensive piece of equipment. So. But it's new this year, so we want to highlight it. And um, Inclusive Touch of Water is new and cheap. And there is a Bible of what you can do or not do um, in federal waters. And there's inland rules and international rules. And on the table back there, we have some um, resources that when we take a break at your leisure, you can peruse it. And um, what it has is the on the left-hand side of the page is what we call international. And the right-hand page is the inland. We're inland. When are you in international? We say three nautical miles off the coast. So if you don't go past um, uh, Boston Light and go three miles out, you are now in international waters. If you're not going to take your boat out there, you have no intention of going out into Massachusetts Bay, you are in inland waters, so you want to be reading on the right side of the page. However, if you do decide that you want to go see if you can find a whale or two and head out to Mass Bay, the rules change a little bit. And we're not going to get into that today, but it's something to, that's why we encourage you to take a boating safety course because you will have a, a whole session just on these rules and what you need. And the, and the other reason this is, these are really important is that in the Weymouth Four River, where we spend a lot of time, there is a huge amount of commercial traffic. There are tankers that are coming down. There's lots of pleasure boats, but there's lobster boats. There's all sorts of types. It's not just recreational boats. You also need to know the requirements for a recreational boat, yeah, for your own boat. And, you know, Sally Gray, we don't have time to get into it, but there's a full set of rules. If a boat's coming this way and you're going that way, well, who does what? <laughs> there are sound signals. Nobody uses them anymore, but they should. Um, we encourage people to. So you should know that you, you technically would be passing port to port. So you don't really not need to signal. But I cannot tell you how often a tanker comes down and people think, Oh, well, you know, I don't have to worry about this tanker. You absolutely have to worry about the tanker. First of all, they have the right of way. And second of all, they cannot stop on a dime. So we had a, you know, you know one, of a, one of those my heart's in my throat moments when a small boat cut across the Four River, engine died, tankers coming down, and they're, they're just there. That, that ship was not going to stop. So we were able to, we had, Fortunately, God was watching this boater, 
He got in, snagged him, pulled him out of the way before the tanker came. So if you see a tanker coming down the Four River or out in Nantasket Roads or wherever, just stay out of the way. Just don't, if you see there where they're headed, just be over here, over there, somewhere else. But I would encourage you to learn about navigation lights at night. Boating at night is a lot of fun. A lot of people don't go out because they're nervous about it. But it's a lot of fun. And if you see a green, a white, a green or red light coming at you, well, someone's coming right at you. If you see just a red light going this way, then you know you're looking at their port side and they're going this way. So it's kind of fun. It's, it's definitely useful to learn what all these rules are. You don't have to go into total depth with it, but learn the more common ones, the ones we're going to see around here. We're going to see people getting towed, we're going to see tankers, we're going to see fishing boats. So learn those sort of common ones. Okay, Jay, next. Um, how to prevent a collision. <laughs> There's something called the seaman's eye. And the seaman's eye is being aware, situation aware, not only what's happening on the boat, but around you. And we have another rule. If you see something, you say something. And not like, oh, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And nobody can understand what you're saying. You can say very calmly and succinctly, oh, I see a big rock in front of us. I think we're in danger. Does anyone else see this? <laughs> because if you get hysterical about it, it just adds to the confusion. So if you can just say, I see, or I hear, or I smell, and state it. And not to the person that you're standing in. Hey, do you see that over there? Do you think we should have Bob on the helmet? Absolutely, positively, not only to Bob, but let the other people on the boat know that, that there is a potential danger here. And I can't tell you, at Boston Light, out at Little Brewster Island, all the grounding that we see, it happens daily. On a Saturday or Sunday, there can be three or four people sitting on Great Brewster Spits. Um, I can't tell you how many boats try to run through Little Booster Island and Great Booster Island. And we'll be on the island and go, no, 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 go back, go back. And they just think that we're going crazy, you know? We'll get a we'll get a bell or a horn. And then all of a sudden you hear the crunch and all the people go like this. And it's like And just sort of remember it's everybody's responsibility on the boat. If if you're especially if you're not driving, generally if you're driving the boat, you're looking straight ahead. You really should have your head on a swivel a little bit, you know, kind of be aware. <laughs> Recreational boating on the weekend is very crowded out there. It's, you know, if everyone's trying to get to where they want to go, and, and so there's a lot going on. So if you're not driving, and you look around, and you say, ah, you know, hey, there's a boat coming up fast on us, and they're going to pass on the port side. So the person driving knows, uh-oh, there may be this huge wake coming my way. And I'll give you another reason. I was out with my brother. He's driving. I turn around, and I see this giant cabin cruiser just boring down the Four River. And he's, like, right on us. And I'm thinking, okay, I know navigation rules. I know I'm a stand-on vessel. I'm supposed to just maintain course and speed. He's going to go around me. So I tell my brother, I said, well, there's a big boat coming astern of us. He's a ways off. And I wait, and he's still coming, and he's still coming. And I'm like, and there's this man at the helm, and he's like this. And now I have this uncomfortable feeling he's not going to turn. So I tell my brother, port, 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 go, go, go. So we swing over, and this boat just keeps right on going. Well, it turns out that as he got pulled over by the harbor master, it turns <laughs> out it was an elderly gentleman. His son was down in the cabin, left his dad up there, and said, steer this course. He just <laughs> steered the course, and he would have just run right over us. So important 
that somebody else is paying attention. If you're in the boat by yourself, it's your job. Your head's going to have to be on a swivel all the time. But if you're on the boat, someone else is driving, and you say, hey, a boat's coming up on us. They're coming up on the starboard side, port side. But also, keep an eye out and make sure they're actually going to go around you. And if not, the general prudential rule of navigation is avoid collision. Your job at that point is to stand on the vessel, maintain course and speed. However, you do whatever you have to do to avoid a collision. You don't say, hey, this is my job, because then the guy's going to, like in our case, the guy's going to run right over us. So. so just be aware, and as Sally said, speak up. If you see something that doesn't look right, then, you know, like my brother wasn't paying attention one day, and I said to him, is there a reason why we're going to run up on Chief Island? Like, do you want to go visit the island? And he's like, what? Oh, I'm sorry, because he was just babbling away. And so you just have to be aware. Feel free to speak up. So in the situation where you have to, like, make a quick decision, is there a better way to go, like, left or right? Um, didn't matter. I just knew. We were in the Four River, and I, had, I knew I had more water that way. So if he was going to pass you and follow the rules, would you go to the right? Depends on how I thought he was going to pass me. You know, generally in that situation, we'd be going like this. This person back here would have declared themselves long before. So okay. they'd either be over here or over there. All right. And you see them move to one side yeah. and the other long. And there's some slides that show you a little bit of that, too. Yeah. And um, we have nav lights that were mentioned and some other slides that we should have or show how those look like when we get into those crossings and head on one. So your lights that you have on your vessel, you need to check them. That's part of your pre-underway check to make sure they work, especially if you're concerned that you might be coming back at dusk or in the dark. And you never know when you're going to come back in case you have a little incident that would have you where you like run out of fuel or something and then <laughs> you get the fuel. And now you're running back in that dark and you're well, careening on that. Next. We also have sound signals that Lisa said, nobody uses those, but they're, they're navigational rules. And there's certain ones that you should be sounding, like the gentleman that was on up at the bridge, okay? They're in the course. Um, and if he were to have been aware of the of, uh, sound signals, he would have been able to signal Lisa and her brother to say whether their intention was to be port or starboard. But the one that's critical here is the bottom one, the danger. If you cannot prevent the collision, if, uh, if you can't go to starboard because the, there's rocks there and you can't go port because that's where the boat's going to collide, you get on the horn or your whistle, whatever you have, five or more blasts. Beep, 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 beep. It's like a wake-up call. And if they're still coming at you, they're not responding, then you do it some more. Beep, 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 beep. And if any of you live by the water in the Four River, when those tankers come down the river, they can't see you. Have you ever put them in a truck? If you can't see the 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 um, the mirrors on either side of the truck, they can't see you. If you are too close to that vessel, they cannot see you. And so when they do see you, their horns are air horns and they're longer. Beep, beep. We're in, we're in North Weymouth. We're in Mile Inland, and we can hear those in the Four River. Uh, so that's the one you want to... On a weekend, I can almost guarantee if a tank is coming in in the time they transit, they will be blasting five <laughs> blasts at least once on the way in. We say, oh, there goes their insurance call. <laughs> so that's the one to put in your neural pathway. Buy them more blasts. Next. And um, there are... We don't have stock lights on the water, or little uh, dotted lines, or double yellow lines, we need to know where the channel is. And they're marked with aids to navigation that the Coast Guard's maintained. And 
You need to know whether you're coming up the river or down the river. Because if you just always keep the red nun on your right, that works coming in, but going out, you're going in shallow water. You're going outside the channel. So the saying is, red right return when returning from seaward. So when you're coming in to Haldod, or we call Western Way, between Quincy and Paddock Island, you're coming in. And then if you're reversing it, it's going to be the opposite. That red nun's going to be on your left. And we're going to see some pictures of that. But do you need it? Do you want to add anything to that, Lisa? Um, no, it's important to understand because channels are sometimes reversed. I mean, there's, there's you know, famous ones like Western Way where you, you think you're coming in and actually you're going out, you know, that type of thing. So it can, it can easily be reversed. So under, you need to look at your chart and understand the channel markings. They're there, it's, it, they're there to help. They're there to help you navigate. But you have to pay attention. I had a friend who's an avid sailor who constantly did not understand channel marking. And I took a famous picture of him and Grim had flats. He took the he took the nun on the wrong side. And I said to him, I, I blew up the picture with a little caption and said, remember, always keep, you know, red number six on on a rim head flats to port. Because there he was at sailboat high and dry. So you need to understand how to read the chart. It's important just to understand what these channel markers are. And then we have regulatory markers, and this is important because we will see this um, in the various um, Boston Harbor. And they're just cautionary signs, such as slow, no wake. What that means is that on my boat, no wake is about five knots. On somebody else's boat, it could be seven, it could be two. So they used to use the uh, use six knots as um, as uh, the the sign would say say six knots or less. That isn't true now. You need to go with your wake. So how do you know if you have a wake? You got to turn your head and look behind you and see. And on a Saturday and Sunday afternoon, when everybody's coming back from their cruising up the Back River and Fall River, it looks like a parade, a parade without pretty things on it. And it, the interesting thing is to try to see, or not try to, you're going to see folks trying to pass each other with all these wakes. It's amazing. It like blows my mind. Um, and you're going to have the experience. But you can do it safely as long as you keep your wake down and you're aware of the boats around you. Just do your little putzen. Just because somebody else is putting up their throttle doesn't mean if they're doing it, then I can do it. Well, you better watch out for Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have charts. And um, we've been sitting now for uh, about 40 minutes. So let's get up and stretch, do a head um, visit. We have six charts, and you're welcome to pick them up, um, look at them, like we're talking about Western Way and Fuller River and the Bath River, and um, we'll have the opportunity to help you uh, decipher it, or you can just take one back to your table and take a look. So let's take five. All right, so we've, um, why do we need charts? Anybody want to answer that? You just had uh, seven minutes of looking at them. It tells us where it's safe to go and where it isn't. And you want to have the chart in the area that you're boating. If any of you go down to Cohasset, because there's a lovely place to anchor down there, um, you're going to need to have a different chart than the one we're looking at, because it doesn't go that, that far down. Next. GPS. Many boats with electronics, with um, with depth sounders, there's a combination that they have now with depth sounders and GPS and what we call navigation plotters. So I don't know what you have on your boat, but one thing you need to do is know how to use it. So this slide is just showing you all the electronic widgetry out there. 
It's something you can practice at home, just working through the functions before going on the boat and be rocking and rolling and trying to be keying something in. So um, that's that one. <laughs> We've already talked about the tide. We have 12 hour cycles here. Six hours the tide coming in, six hours the tide's going out. It comes back in, it comes back out. And did you know that so the one tide is higher than the other one? So that's where the tide chart comes in very handy. We have low water and lower low water, and if you're a sailboat with big stick at the top and you need to go under a bridge, you need to know what the higher of the highest tide is. And our average tide swing between high and low is nine and a half feet. That's the average. But the highest we have is um, on a regular lunar cycle is, that I can remember, is 13.7. The tides are rising, and a 13-footer was one that was an anomaly. It isn't anymore. We get 13-foot tides um, a number of times now. And it's interesting that the lower tides, they can go to a minus 8 or a minus 8.5. So you'll see more land than you ever did before, and you're going to say, wow, that, this area doesn't look the way it usually looks at low tide because of that lunar cycle. In operating your vessel safely, we showed a picture of doing the uh, pre-underway check to make sure that all your safety gear is there and that it works, such as your nav lights. How you load the boat is really important. Jake and my boat is 20 feet, and we have light people that come on the board, and we have heavy people that come on board. And when we're coming in for a landing, we tell everybody on deck, don't move. Because if the heavyweight person wants to, a heavier weight person decides to put the bender up before they're asked to do it, and I'm coming in to my slip and they move, it's like I've lost control of the boat. And one of the things that I used to play with is um, not at high speed, but at a, um, an average speed, let's say uh, 11 knots. I would step away from the helm and I would go in the back of the boat and shift my weight back and forth. And to, to see how, it's just something I play with. I'm growing up now, I don't do that anymore. Um, but you can actually steer the boat just by shifting my weight because it's a small, lighter weight vessel. Um, so how you place your gear, where your gear is placed and where you put your, your, um, your passengers. So one of the things that we say on the boat uh, if you're going to move, you need to let us. We need to be prepared to, um, for that, that weight shift. Uh, courtesy on the water. Um, you can get anxious on the boat. And when you get anxious, you can get bitchy. And when that happens, and someone, especially coming in at the end of the day, and you're tired and what have you, and some boat is passing you, closely in the back river going eight knots while you're pooping along at four and they're throwing the wig up and what do you want to say to that person you chuck i can actually touch your boat and you're passing me and leaving a weight behind stay cool <laughs> don't let them ruin your day yeah that's what i say and so um in here we have an example of loading the boat And the safe loading, the center of gravity on the boat is different for each boat. And you'll know that by reading the manual that you're going to get with your boat, where that is. It's typically, and my boat is in the middle of the boat um, and a little aft, that's, that is where the balance boat is. That's the center point. And everything that gets placed on the boat, including the people, are going to affect whether I'm listing this way or this way or bow heavy or stern heavy. And always have one hand for you and one hand on the boat. Doesn't matter even if it's a 40 foot cabin cruise, a, a road wave can come or a big wake can come. And if you're not in that situation of awareness, 
there could be an injury on the boat. And then um, this is an example of, um, we can't get into boat handling here. That's, that's a course into itself. But one thing to walk away with today is how you cross into a wave or have the wave coming at your stern or what have you is going to affect the safety of the vessel and who's on it. And if we're having waves that are coming to the side of the boat, so this is the boat right here, and we get a broadside, it could literally, if it doesn't flip the boat and it's a big enough wave, it can swamp the boat. And we've had that happen. Um, I was coming back from Boston Lake and there were swells. And I knew that I wanted to come in close to shore. And where I was wasn't bad, but the closer I got to Hull Gut, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I went more and more to the town of Hull. And then this rogue wave came like a six footer, came in up over the engine into the boat. And we are standing in deeper than <laughs> an ankle deep. And you know what I did? I started laughing. I thought it was so funny because I'm so conscious and it's like, where did that come from? Because these were two to three footers. And then this rogue wave. So what did we do? We were self-failing boats, so if we put way on, it, we could have emptied it out. However, because of the seas, I didn't want to be jumping these waves. We have um, a Clorox bottle that we cut out, plus a hand pump. So we were just hauling out the water until we could get enough water out so we could then do the rest of it. But those are the kinds of things that you might run into. And um, I don't know why I thought it was so funny, but it was good because the crew member that was with me, he started laughing too. So we just had a, we just had a, a salt water bath. We had a food bath. And just a word of caution, if you're out in Nantasca Roads, um, so you go out through Hellgut, you're hanging a right is in Nantasca Roads, it's famous for what we call a confused sea. There's Harding Ledge, so as you get around Boston Light and that area, you can very often, if the seas are running, you can very often get a rogue wave here, here or there. So be aware, look around, you know, again, head on a swivel. Um, you, know, you know, if it's a, a nice day, it's probably okay, but if we've had a storm and it turned everything up, you might get a day or two of heavy seas. But just be aware that they're not always going to be nice little waves coming at you like this. So be aware that you might get something that you have to react quickly to. And it could be over the stern. <laughs> it could be the stern. <laughs> and um, there are strategies on how to get into your dock and out of the dock. And that's why we encourage you to take a boating safety class or surf the, the web so that you can have in your third eye what it is you want to try to do and then try it. And one of the things that in the Weymouth Back River, we have the currents, right? We get these little swirly things. Where my boat is, our boat is, is close in toward, um, right up toward the, the marina office itself. We get these weird currents running through there. So I come in and I think I'm gonna do a perfect landing and the next thing I know I'm going this way. It's like, wow, no two, way, no two days are exactly the same way. So you can perfect the way and then you're going to perfect that. And then you're going to perfect the next one and the next one. So don't think there's only one way to get your boat in to the, into, the, um, into your finger dock if you have it. So be prepared for that. It's always going to be a little adventure. One, one of the things I would encourage you to do is, um, you know, Grape Island, no one's allowed to tie up there because the ferry boats go and they tie up the water taxis. So when you see the water taxi leave, go play on that dock. So come in, approach the dock like this, then approach it, you know, with port side two, then come around and do it starboard side two, and just play. Just play with it, get used to your boat. And as Sally said, if, you know, you can play that day, and the next day the wind is coming in the other direction. But just get out and, and take the time, because if they have big tires there, you're not going to hurt the boat. So just take the time and put in, you know, just practice all sorts of different directions coming into that dock. And um, 
preparing to duck, you should. <laughs> you do not want to overextend yourself. You never want to use your body as a fender. <laughs> you ever heard anybody using their body as a fender? Then you can hear a crunch. <laughs> and that's why uh, uh, a strategy is what we call a walking fender. You have a fender on the line. Instead of using your hand to push yourself or, or defend the boat, you always use a fender. You think you can reach out and hold that dog? A very dangerous thing to do. A foot? Oh, I'll use my foot. <laughs> uh, so this guy here on the left, he's a little precarious. He's outreaching what he should be reaching. In trying to float in piers, we have wine with us today, and we have cleats. And one of the things that you want to put on your list to become prof proficient at is once you get into the dock to get the line around the cleat. And then once you do, what do you do with it? How do you keep it from slipping and having the boat float away? And on this slide, notice how it says bow line, spring line, stern line. So I don't know on the back if you can see it, but the bow line comes from the bow over. The, these spring lines are coming from here forward, here aft. Because you may have someone that's driving the boat and says, oh, go put the, you know, I want, a, I want an aft spring. And you're like, okay, aft, number one, where's aft? Two, what's a spring? So, you know, it's handy to kind of know the terms and, you know, and basically that's, it's a very simple way to tie the boat up. But just know that it's bow lines, stern lines, spring lines. And um, anchoring in Boston Harbor is a fun thing to do. You can get close into the islands. Um, if you have a little dinghy or a paddleboard or something, you can then go into the island. And the anchor that's holding your boat that's going to determine how you do that, and the strength of that is going to determine if the boat's going to be there when you get back. Or if you do have a lunch hook and then just uh, lay on the deck to get a little sun rays, and you're not paying attention, your boat could be in a different position. Uh, and we have, well, we have a normal scope of line that you need during calm seas and heavy weather. Uh, and you always need to know when you're planning, this is your pre-planning, if you want to anchor, not only are you going to look at the tide chart to see what the water depth is, because that's the average. Now you want to go and look to see how high the high tide is going to be and how low is the low. Because if you do, a, you're setting a 7 to 1 ratio. So for every foot, you're going to put up 7 feet of line. And you, the chart says that there's, um, that there's going to be seven feet of water there. But this is a tide, a super high tide. It's going to be eight and a half feet. And so you're going to be a, sure, a few, you're going to be uh, you know, like 14 or less, maybe 12 feet short. So what you're going to do is have, instead of having the anchor out, line out like this so you can get a nice ride on it, it's going to be straight down. And as the seas come in or, or wind, it's going to be pulling up like this. And it could literally pull the anchor up. And then you start drifting away and saying, what happened? You always want to know in advance where you think you're going to go and, what you, and where you're going to anchor. And make sure that you have this mathematical formula plus more. So if you, especially if you're doing overnight at, at um, um, off of George's Island or something. You want to be able to easily be able to put more line out. Or if you find that a low tide and there's somebody else, I'm here, there's another boat right here, and the tide goes out, and now you have all the slack line, I could be coming down on this boat here. And that's why if you do do overnight um, uh, anchoring, uh, set your alarm, and take turns with whoever's on the boat with you to check to see if you're still where you think you are. And if you're, and if you're saying, I'm never going to anchor my boat. We're just always going to go out cruising. We're always going to go out fishing. I'm never going to anchor my boat. <laughs> I will encourage you to practice anchoring your boat. Because as I said earlier, if something goes wrong, it generally goes wrong fast. And if you need to quickly, your engine has just died. You're being blown up to the rocks. You need to get an anchor out. That's not the time to learn how, how to put the anchor out. 
So even if you're never going to anchor to stay anchored, practice with your anchor, put it out, see how it, you know, how it works, how much line you need. It's just a, it's just a good habit to get into. So even if you're never going to anchor, practice. And depending upon the size and the weight of your boat depends upon how, how big or heavy your anchor should be. And for 3A Marine, they will help you to identify uh, what that anchor is and give you sufficient line for um, initial line for it. And then you always want extra line on the boat. You never can have enough line. And now we get into the legal requirements of boating. <laughs> you know, got those. <laughs> Next. And uh, we have the numbering. And because we're in Massachusetts, our, all our numbers are MS. And if 3A Marine is preparing your boat for you, they will know how to put those letters on and letters and numbers on. Next. And you need a registration. And the registration in the state of Massachusetts expires every two years. It's up to you to monitor that. Typically, you get a notice, but don't count on it. So I know that my boat's going to need another registration in, by April 2022. So I don't wait to get the notice. I'll go in in, um, in March. And your registration needs to be on the boat. We, you know, we tend to not want to put it on the boat because we're thinking, oh, you know, I don't want it to get wet or whatever. Well, you know, put it in a, in a plastic baggie or something and put it in a in some place safe. But it needs to be on the boat, okay, <laughs> not home. Can you take a picture of it and have it on your phone? Is that no. sufficient? Okay. No. And what is negligent operation? Operating in restricted areas. Wake jumping, that's really important. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen cabin crews that put out big wakes, like three or four foot wakes, and then you will have the, you'll see a, a smaller boat come and jump it. That's against the law. It's extraordinarily dangerous to uh, a, a ski, um, what do they call jet it? Ski. Get, jet ski. Jet skis are big on that too. Huge safety data. And failure to regulate your speed, we talked about that earlier, operating while under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And, and you may not know this, but in Massachusetts, if you are caught boating while intoxicated, you can lose your car and automobile license because there's no licenses needed for a boat. So they had no way to enforce and regulate this. So the person driving the boat, if they're fine, everybody else can have had a big party and they're, you know, they're not, they're all happy. But the operator of the boat absolutely cannot be under the influence. And be careful. We talked earlier about having water on board. It is amazing how much more quickly you can feel the effects of alcohol on the boat. You're, you're bouncing up and down. You got the engine noise. It's hot you will get intoxicated much faster than you would probably on land. So my advice is whoever's driving the boat, just drink water, don't even drink, because it's just not, it's not worth it. We've had horrible, horrendous accidents out there. People have died, they've lost limbs, people have lost their you know, driving license, have gone to, had to go to court. So it's just, it's not worth it. So I encourage people, if you're driving the boat, you're like in a car, you're the designated driver, okay? And one can of beer is equal to three on the water for all those conditions Lisa just rattled off. One is equal to three. I think we hit that enough, okay? <laughs> We've talked about life jackets and we have a couple up here. And we're, we're near the end here. We're going to have time to look at that equipment and look at charts, tie knots, and cleats. One of the things you need on your boat if you have gasoline is fire extinguishers. And because what catches on fire on the boat are going to be fuel type things, oils and fuels. So the Class A um, fire extinguisher would not put that out. So we need one that has a combination of a B and a C for oils and electricity. And once again, 3A Marine will be 
able to ensure that you have the proper one on board. The way I always remember these, like what, what's A, B, or C? A is anything that leaves an ash. I always think of B as like, you know, gasoline, so boom, you know, anything that might blow up. And then electrical is current, so that's C. So A is ash, B is boom, and C is current. And um, do we have a fire? We have yeah. a fire extinguisher over there. And um, when you're in the green, you're good. When you're in the red, you're dead. So you want to make sure to check your this fire good extinguisher. One. And it's not enough to just do it in the spring when you launch the boat. We talk about doing clear and away checks and things like that. It will take you a nanosecond to look to see if that's in the space. So that's the gauge or rusting, the or if it's hitting, it's missing. And here's a uh, direction. Pull the pin aim at the base of the fire. Squeeze the handle, and it sinks like so. And we'll have an opportunity to walk you through that motion. And now we get into the light that we were talking about. We have two boats. We're seeing one. We have the red light, the, the green light, and the white light. And then we're seeing on the boat on the right a green. So we know that we are looking at the starboard side of that vessel. And when we see the, the white lights in the back, that's a larger boat where there's a light up top with a looks like a, a cookie monster bite out of it. And the bottom one fits it. And this is why even if you do not want to go out on your boat at night, go with someone else that's done it. And just get familiar with what this looks like moving colors in the water and where you are in relation to them. Next. And then we get into visual distress signals. There's many of them. 3M Marine will ensure that if you're buying your boat this season, that you have the minimal required. And how can you get help? You can wave your arms. You can sound a whistle. You can light off a flare. And we have a lot of divers that are in the harbor, and these are their flags. The blue and white one is called the alpha flag, and that goes on the boat, and then the red one is tethered, so you actually know where the diver is in relation to the boat. You never want to drive between the two flags. And it's against the law to throw trash in the harbor. Boston used to be one of the worst ones in the world. And now we are, we get uh, five gold stars. And um, the Coast Guard can't stop and board your vessel. You know how police officers need to do a quota of um, ticketing in your town for revenue? Well. The same happens with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard has a quota that they have to meet. And so you may not see a red flag at all. They just might need to get meet the quota for that month or that quarter. And uh, come and over it's, to it's not, it's not for revenue, it's for um, safety checks. The idea is they want to you know, check a certain number of boats to make sure that people are out there and operating safely. Because we really don't, we don't really get the revenue. You gotta buy, it's gonna go into some big pot somewhere that the government takes and we'll never see it. So <laughs> And the reason for that is because you can't get out of your boat and walk home. So by them doing the spot check, they're just keeping everybody in awareness for gee, do I have all the equipment that I have in my boat? And boating stresses increased risk. Glare, heat and sun, motion, noise, vibration. And many boaters underestimate under that effect. They don't really notice it until they're back on the mainland and they start, they're still walking. <laughs> Avoid dehydration, we chatted about that. First aid kit, not required, highly recommended. Watch the weather, the weather watches. And one of the handouts, that you have is a pink one. 
and this is just something I threw together at the last minute. The keeper's lesson learned from living and commuting to the lighthouse. <laughs> and um, the weather is a big one. Um, it means that you want to develop that seaman's eye and be in that situation awareness. What the weather report says and what it actually is on the water can be significantly different. And you need to know. And if in doubt, don't go out. Uh, where can you find the marine water forecast? Do we need the, I'm sorry, what's the question? Um, uh, the marine radio. Um, the, the marine weather there's forecast? A, there's a, uh, yeah, there's a weather channel on the marine radio. Okay. And I would advise you to, you know, listen to that. And as Sally said, I mean, I know I have folks that are somewhat inland. And I'll say, man, the wind is really blowing today. And they'll be like, no, it's not. And I'll be like, well, by my house it is, because I'm like out on the peninsula. And it's like, the, you know, we will have the coastal wind, and they have nothing inland. So you really need to know what's going on out on the water. There's and also so a couple it, of apps. I think Noah has an app called Buoy Weather. Buoy Weather. Okay. And you can kind of, like, pick the buoy that's closest to your harbor. Like, if you're going out of city, but you can click the SA buoy outside the harbor, and it can give you the forecast for that night. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And these are pictures of FM radios, one's a handheld, and one's the one that you install in the boat. Just to reiterate, you have a handheld, you may get it a, a mile. You could get more, depending upon the atmospheric conditions and whether you've got a, a cement condo next to you or not. And thank you for joining us, being safe while having fun on the water. So our next part, we've got 20 minutes to do show and tell. We've got wine, we've got some life jackets, and sharks. Thank you for that. Thank you. What's the best way to go to the line to try to get it around? Good question. Great question. I think, aside from learning how to put a line on a tree, one of the most important nuts that you can learn is a bowline. So, we'll start with a bowline, then we'll do a cleat. And I'm going to teach you how to tie it like a seaman. You know, when the, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, they make a little rabbit hole and they bring it up. On a boat, you need to be able to do it quickly and efficiently. So, I usually say, can I just, can I pick up your phone? Yes. Uh, you have a handout, it's down at the bottom. It's the one that has the number with knots on it. So that's going to be your ultimate goal. That's what we're aiming for. That's going to be our perfect bowling. So I'm sort of like holding it like this. So the, the bitter end, this is the bitter end, this is the standing part. The bitter end is in my right hand. I'm just going to make an X. I'm just going to cross, cross my fingers over. Let go with your left hand. And then you can just kind of hold this bite. We're making a bite. We're making a loop in the line. Just turn your right hand up. And now you're going to have a smaller bite. So you've got this big loop here. You've got a little small bite. Take the bitter end. I'll come around. Don't worry. Take the bitter end. <laughs> Go around the standing part, back through, and where you want to end up is the bitter end is on the inside of the loop. <laughs> All right, there we go again. Sal, you want to walk around and help? All right, you're going to cross the hands over. I'm left-handed. That's my excuse. Oh. I can do it right-handed. That's all right. I can show you left-handed. I had to do that. When we were teaching, we had a, we had a South Park. It was great when we were doing that. <laughs>
All right, so I'm always going to take my right, in this case, my right hand, flip it up. So you have a big bite, big loop, and a little loop. I got much better. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now I can let go with my right 